Welcome to Module 1 of Aquatic Ecology or Limnology. Uh, my name is John Downing. I'm a limnologist and an ecologist, and I created this course and uh, really enjoy teaching it, so I hope that you enjoy it too. In this introductory talk, I'd like to talk about a variety of things, but first I should tell you a little bit about what I think limnology and aquatic ecology are. I don't really distinguish much between them, although they are not equivalent to each other. Uh, limnology um, was derived from the field of geology and had a lot to do with chemistry and physics and geog geography and geology, became more and bio more biological as time went on and more ecological, and so it actually um, it al also includes aquatic ecology. So limnology is just a little bit broader. Franz Rüttner, a very famous limnologist um, who wrote probably the first and most seminal limnology book that's been written, called Limnology, the Study of Inland Waters, uh, where uh, the uh, limne means lake in Greek and logos is discourse. Um, although limnology teaches a variety of different kinds of e ecosystems, not just lakes, but also ponds and um, and wetlands and rivers and streams uh, and virtually any system that is uh, included in lim inland water, um, it is not simply lakes. Frank Riegler and Rob Peters, two famous Canadian limnologists who um, uh, who worked at div diverse universities in Canada, uh, wrote a wonderful book called Science and Limnology, and in that they l define limnology as the scientific study of fresh waters, and go on to say that limnologists may be physicists, chemists, mathematicians, geologists, hydrologists, engineers, or any of a host of other specialists. And in fact, um, I take exception with part of this. It's not just fresh waters, because of course, something like 40% of the waters uh, on continents is uh, made up of sa saline waters also. Um, so um, they may have just overlooked them temporarily. But the main important part of this is that limnologists practice many different fields. And so limnology is actually one of the very first um, interdisciplinary sciences. Jakob Kalf, who wrote the book that we base this, um, uh, this uh, series of talks on, defined limnology as the study of lakes, rivers, and wetlands as systems. The idea of system is extremely important here because we think of systems as interrelated pieces. And um, lakes, rivers, and wetlands, and ponds, and streams are systems in that organisms are connected to non-living environment and um, many diff there are many different interacting parts that make the system work. Finally, when I I'm asked about what limnology might be um, t by lay people, I will say limnology is a science that keeps lakes and streams clean and healthy. And I like to base um, that definition really on the breadth of things limnologists do, but also the importance of the field. And we'll talk quite a bit more about that in the next little while. Well, here's a blue planet, the one we live on. Actually, if you look right about smack dab in the middle, that's where I work. You can see the Great Lakes uh, up and to the right here of the, uh, uh, in, on the uh, U.S., uh, sorry, the North American continent. Um, and, uh, and, uh, so, but the, but the planet looks blue in general. Well, the reason it looks blue is basically, uh, it's based on the properties of water, and we'll be learning quite a good deal about that in the next, um, a few modules. My objectives for this session one are to get you to think about why limnology and aquatic ecology are important to you and to society. Um, and to do that, we're going to review where water is found in the biosphere. We're going to learn the three categories of water use. We're going to also learn how important sustainable use can be and how we're not really um, practicing sustainable use of water. We'll learn about scientists who study water resources. And so basically look at the, an overview of limnology and aquatic ecology. First thing I'd like to do is talk about what has brought you to this course. Well, we could start with what brought me to this course, and it's basically this lake. This is a lake at about 94 degrees um, west latitude, longitude and, and 47 and a half degrees north latitude. 
Um, it's in the central, north central part of the state of Minnesota in the United States. I spent a great deal of time on this lake as a child. And uh, in fact, I've lived on this lake um, every year since I was born. And my parents before, uh, before me, uh, almost their entire lives as well. I was a little different in looking at this lake that I spent, I was a certified scuba diver uh, when I was nine years old. And I spent a terrific amount of time underneath this lake, looking at the various living components that make it up. And um, I can still picture many different scenes underneath the water. And it's quite wonderful that many of them don't change from one year to the next, these sort of landscapes beneath this lake. Water clarity is about 25 feet or you know, somewhere in the neighbor of ten, neighborhood of 10 meters. Very lovely lake. So what I'd like you to do on the the uh, blackboard system is go on to the um, uh, go on to the um, discussion pages for session one, and and I'd like you to write down a few things and discuss a few things with other people in the class as well as the rest of us. First, I'd like you to say what your name is, tell tell where you're from, and then I'd like you to say what your favorite aquatic ecosystem is, and in that I'd like you to give. The exact name, not just the category. Don't say, I like the sea, but say, I like a particular place and tell us what that is and why. And then I'd like you to, uh, actually, I'd like you to take a picture of yourself in front of this ecosystem, if you possibly can, uh, or some system around you, and post that also on the discussion board. Um, or if you're too shy, you don't have to put your own picture. You can put a picture of the system and tell us about it. And then I'd like you to talk about one thing you'd like to uh, learn to know, learn, know, understand, or do in this class. What would you like to come away from the class knowing? And perhaps we can answer some of those right away on the discussion board. And then you should probably do this today or tomorrow. Go on to Blackboard and pose one trivia question about aquatic ecosystems that you'd like answered and look at the others that are out there and answer any that you can. It should take you 15 minutes or less to do the entire th uh, entire little assignment. Thanks for doing this, by the way. It'll be fun, and um, it's often enjoyable to hear what other people are interested in. Next, I'd like to talk uh, briefly about the hydrologic cycle, because although you see, if you look up on that little landscape ahead of you there, um, there, there are streams up there and lakes up there, and they get there via the hydrologic cycle, and they're just a, an interconnected part of it. So I'll play you a sort of a little animation and talk you through it. You should be watching for uh, water molecules. Water is H2O, uh, two hydrogens and one oxygen, so you'll see a big ball with little bumps on it. Um, keep an eye for them and watch how they move, and we'll kind of talk our way through it. <laughs> So you see the water vapor. Now the sun heats the sea. The sea covering a large amount of the planet then evaporates water. A little water mo molecule moves up into the atmosphere, precipitates down on the landscape, on the continents. And then that water moves in various ways by runoff, running over the surface of the soil, driving down into the groundwater. And then if it happens to get to the groundwater, it moves along the aquifer down and is eventually discharged either into a lake or a pond or into the sea or even a stream. And here you see another water molecule moving into, into the sea, back to the sea via a river. The cycle just repeats. Evaporation, transport onto continents, precipitation, percolation into the groundwater, runoff, and water moves back back to the ocean. So it's that short residence on the land surface um, that makes limnology and aquatic ecology. Here's, here's another way to look at the hydrologic cycle. And this one's got numbers on it. Um, and just to give you an idea about how much material moves, these are in billions of gallons per day. I'm sorry about the imperial units, but this was a very nice figure, and I didn't want to ignore it simply because it was using these odd uh, units of gallons. For those of you who don't know what a gallon is, it's about four liters. Um, what you can see here is the ocean evaporates a large amount of moisture into the atmosphere. This falls as precipitation, and about um, 10% of that precipitation in the atmosphere falls out every day. 
That water runs along through stream flow, also percolates in as groundwater recharge, moves down to the water table, and then um, the water moves along the groundwater and discharges into um, streams or discharges directly into the sea or into lakes and the lakes can overflow and their water will flow down to the streams and and basically um, every day just you know the ocean stays basically at balance uh, with about 1200 billion gallons of of water coming in per day and um, uh, and so we put about actually an overall uh, 1300 billion gallons of water uh, or, um, per day into the sea and about that same amount going out so that's how the hydrologic cycle looks. We have some consumptive use of water uh, along the way. It's used in uh, industry and in other ways, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. So let's talk about how much water there is on the planet. All the water, if you look at all the water of the Earth, about 97.2% of that water is in the oceans. And so very little of it is actually on the continents or in the atmosphere. About 2.8% of the water on the planet is found on the continents. And then if you look at the continental water, about 70% of that continental water is frozen into ice caps and glaciers, although they're melting pretty fast. About 30% of that water is as liquid. Then if you take that liquid water on continents over to the far right, you'll find that about 96% of that water is as groundwater held in the particles beneath the soil. And then um, only, oh well, only a little more than 3% of it exists at the surface or in soils with about 1.5% of the liquid uh, water on continents as, as freshwater lakes, about 1.4% of them being saline lakes, uh, uh, well, are saline lakes, about 1.4% of the liquid water on continents are saline lakes, a little bit of soil moisture, 0.8%, and then just a tiny bit of rivers and streams, all in rivers and streams, although they're moving pretty rapidly. Just to let you visualize this a little bit, we have a fraction of a fraction of a fraction, but overall if you um, know how big a football field and you and you equate the length of a football field to all the world's water. The water that we can use every day that's in the inland waters is about one centimeter of that football field just as a, a, a means of thinking about how how little uh, there is of, of all the water in the world, how little is actually usable to people on an everyday basis for consumption, for industry, for agriculture and so on much of the water on the earth is not usable for those purposes. So how much water is there in the world? Oh, really a lot. There's 1.3 million cubic kilometers. Um, a, a cubic kilometer is 1,000 meters or 1,000 yards on a side. So you get some sense of the magnitude of that. The continental water is about 40,000 cubic kilometers or 2.8% of, um, of the overall um, amount of water. And then atmospheric water is about 0.001% of that, or a puny 13 cubic kilometers uh, dispersed through all the atmosphere of the Earth. Now, there are, I've, uh, it sounds as if I'm saying marine waters aren't important. That's not at all true. They're very important for a variety of different things. But I would like to sort of contrast inland waters with oceans, or what you may know about oceans. Now, if you look at the fraction of the world's surface water area, um, about 3% is inland waters, and 97% is oceans. Um, so a lot more ocean, um, ocean um, w water than inland water. <coughs> Excuse me. However, if you look at the fraction of world's usable water, about 99% is in inland waters. And that 99% only stays there for a very short time. So, but it, although its renewal rate is only really about seven percent per year, the um, uh, the residence time of of water um, water in lakes is about 17 years. That means, on average, a molecule of water will stick around in a lake for about 17 years, and about five years in a wetland, and only 32 days in streams and rivers. So that's you know you know they're flowing and they're going downstream. So clearly, it doesn't take them that long um, to get to the sea. Par by contrast, um, the oceans have a, a residence time of 2,500 years, so water stays there quite a bit longer, although 
um, uh, although it, it is being refreshed at a fairly substantial rate. Well, of course, you know, one two thousand five hundredth of the ocean volume flows into it um, in, by precipitation or by rivers um, every day, every year, sorry. Now, I'm really interested in biodiversity, and you probably are too. Um, and there really exists no perfect estimate of biodiversity in inland waters, but um, there is a fairly good one for the oceans. The thought is that the oceans of the world contain about a million different species of organisms, um, that be not counting bacteria and so on. The inland waters of, of the world probably uh, contain about a quarter of a million, but we've inventoried less than 5% of them. So there's a lot of biodiversity out there in inland waters we don't know about. As a contrast, about 25% of the species, this is an estimate of course, are, are known. Um, and um, they have about 75% of them to be yet um, discovered. We have 95% or more in inland waters. And so uh, we likely will have many species lost before we know they're there. The reason, of course, we have so many species per unit area is because lakes are small and isolated, whereas the lake uh, for uh, the oceans, there's quite a lot of exchange among uh, different areas in the sea. Now, fish biodiversity. Fish are highly biodiverse in inland waters. About 40% of all fish biodiversity is found in inland waters, whereas only about 60% is found in the oceans. It gives you some sense of the immense biodiversity, especially found in tropical areas. One area in Brazil that I know had 18 different species of catfish as, a, um, as, as an example. And if you think about the importance of water to people uh, being a very strategic resource, about 99.9% .9 of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of some inland water resource, water resource whereas only 33% of the world's population lives within 100 kilometers of any of the oceans, and only 10% live within the tidal area of the oceans. Another aspect that's very interesting as we um, uh, as we see changes, climatic changes and um, global changes in uh, atmosphere and other areas, is the amount of oxygen that might be supplied to us by different waters of the world. We simply don't know this for lakes and inland waters. I think it's probably a fairly large number. Oceans are purported to have about 50 to 85 percent of the oxygen supply originating in marine systems. Um, you've heard people say that every second breath you take uh, the oxygen in that breath was supplied by uh, by algae, possibly true, but um, it may be also supplied to a great extent by some of the very productive waters of uh, inland waters of the world. Uh, fish landings are important to people, of course, as a food source, and uh, only about 10 percent of of the world's fish landings come from inland waters, about 99 percent from the oceans. But the 10 percent is growing v via aquaculture whereas the 90% found in oceans is declining due to overexploitation. As I said before, 77% of continental freshwater is frozen in glaciers and ice caps, and this is shrinking somewhat um, due to global change, um, but um, frozen water is still an important amount of the uh, water resource on the continents. The liquid continental water is located principally as groundwater, um, about 1.5% in freshwater lakes, 1.2% in saline lakes, a bit in soil moisture, and some in rivers and streams. Freshwater is really the Earth's most strategic resource. Um, societies rise and fall because of it, and rich countries have a lot of it. Poor ones have none, and that's because water is essential for, for growing food and having a wealthy life. Wars have been fought over it for over 4,000 almost 5,000 years. Um, if you really, um, and, and uh, there's a guy named, um, uh, excellent author named Peter Glick, G-L-E-I-C-K, who's written books on the world's water and discusses how water has been used as a military tool, uh, military target, as a, as a target of terrorism. 
Um, it, it's been central in development disputes um, and since about 3000 BC. Um, and if you're interested in it, this, please look it up. I'll show you a few of these kinds of disputes, but um, water is definitely a strategic resource that has been the foundation of a great deal of dispute on the planet. For example, back even as far as 2500 BC, there was a king of Lagash named Urlama uh, who wanted to um, um, conquer the people of Uma and so simply diverted um, the waters in a boundary canal uh, to dry up the water supply of that area. This is in the, um, now is in the area occupied by Iraq. Um, also over in that same area in Assyria, uh, as early as 720 BC, a king named Sargon II of Assyria destroyed the entire Armenian irrigation network to flood their land and cause them harm. Even some of our heroes like Leonardo da Vinci and Machiavelli um, built a, a very elaborate plan um, during the time that uh, Florence and Pisa were in conflict and their plan was to divert the Arn Arno River away from Pisa and of course uh, destroy them due to lack of water. In, also in, um, in Asia, General Gao Mingheng um, uh, breached the dikes on the Huanghe to, um, to flood uprising peasants who were causing him problems. Um, this was back in 1642. And even in the Revolutionary War of the United States, the British attacked the New York waterworks um, to um, uh, cause a resource shortage to the Continental Army. Oh, there are tons of other examples. Water has been contaminated, diverted, poisoned, and used in various other charming approaches um, to, uh, as, a, as a military tool and as a major source of conflict. Here's a timeline of the development of the two important water uh, sciences, um, and they are limnology on the left and oceanography on the right. We don't need to go through these in detail, but I wanted you to get some sense of where these sciences came from. Studies of lakes by Varanius and, uh, and Boyle um, uh, uh, on the oceans uh, started as early as the 1600s, and we can count them back farther if we want using studies of navigation and currents and so on, but generally we um, the two sciences started in the 1600s, but really reached um, uh, reached a fairly substantial peak, and not a peak, but a, a, a substantial amount of activity in the 1800s as a diversity of scientists began to study things like chemistry, uh, the physics of water motion, oxygen cycles, uh, water clarity. Um, and by uh, the late 1800s, uh, both marine and inland waters fisher, fish resources were deemed to be overexploited already a very long time ago, a good 150 years before the recording of this talk, um, fish uh, were thought to be very overexploited. And then a lot of studies were undertaken in both of these fields in order to examine the uh, product, uh, productivity capacity of um, both marine and freshwater ecosystems. And um, uh, the sciences are both extremely healthy today and actually uh, are converging in the kinds of studies uh, they do. Well, we use water for a lot of things as it flows through the hydrologic cycle. You can see the up, upper, uh, um, the headwaters up at the top of this figure. Water falls on the landscape, flows into lakes and rivers and streams, and is held for various amounts of times using, um, uh, using dams and impoundments. Um, much of the recreational use of waters is, has very small impact on it other than, um, well, other than changing, uh, if, if we use dams in order to create recreational waters, and clearly we change the kind of water we have from slow moving, fast moving water to slower moving water. Um, on the other hand, things like um, municipal withdrawals uh, and conversion into sewage and farm ponds, stock watering and irrigation, steam power plants and factories coming sort of downstream all have a larger effect really on the water, destroying it in various ways. And it's important to remember that water can be destroyed in a couple of ways. It can be diverted into the atmosphere or the sea, which makes it less us usable, but it also can be polluted to a degree that you no longer can use it well um, without great investments 
um, in, um, in cleaning it up. And this is the case oftentimes with things like sewage and factories and also with irrigation water. High quality water is really needed for a lot of uses and this um, list contrasts three different categories of use. Um, the two major sort of bookends on this are cons consumptive uses and passive uses. So consumption means that you're actually changing that water in a substantial enough way that you could consider it used. So domestic water supplies do this because they divert it into sewer systems. Livestock uh, watering operations do this because they pollute the water substantially and cause it um, to be unusable for, say, drinking water or other sources. Irrigation sends a substantial amount of water back into the atmosphere, but also can salinate or make, uh, make water salty, um, cause it to be nutrient, too nutrient rich to be very helpful. A very useful downstream or very healthy. Also industries tend to put um, uh, various and varying kinds of materials into the water uh, rendering them less useful for other uh, other purposes. A thermoelectric power generation doesn't change water terribly much uh, but also there's a thing called thermal pollution that can really cause the, um, a change in the health of ecosystems downstream and any kind of pollution can cause uh, big changes in water that make render it less useful for additional uh, additional purposes. Well, there are some physical uses that sometimes have um, very moderate but sometimes severe changes in quality associated with them. Hydroelectric power uh, dams can um, often cause major changes in the water chemistry oxygen and also have some implications for global change in creating places where large amounts of, of carbon are, are emitted to the atmosphere. Um, transportation is quite important, uh, an important thing, transportation of ore and goods from one place to another and generally doesn't change the water very much but in cases where transportation yields spills of things like petroleum products or chemicals or other things then transportation uses can have a big impact and the third category of use is the passive use and this has usually little impact on quality recreational use for example doesn't really change the water uh, substantially um, uh, in, unless there's a lot of heavy boating activity or something like that. Um, commercial fisheries and other resource uh, resource exploitation rarely make big changes to the water and could, could be considered to be not consumptive but um, pretty much a passive use of the water. Well this big diagram kind of shows you where all the water comes from and where it goes and this is for the United States uh, looking at um, surface waters over here on the left uh, these are surface fresh waters in light blue, surface saline waters in darker blue, groundwater in green, and that would be the fresh groundwater, and ground, saline groundwater in the sort of the dark green. Um, what you can tell from this is for surface water, its use is very large, um, but most of it is diverted here to irrigation, um, and about twice as much um, uh, is diverted over to thermoelectric cooling. And as I said, Thermoelectric uh, pl uh, power generation doesn't change the water very much, but it changes the kinds of water we have, um, it, and it also can cause uh, issues for fisheries and biodiversity. But it is discharged much of that water, and um, and then can go on to be used for other things. Irrigation water, on the other hand, leads to a large amount of evaporation and um, and percolation into the groundwater. Um, and uh, relatively less of it is discharged, sometimes highly polluted, or actually most of the time highly polluted, either with salts or nutrients. And so um, it could be also considered to be pretty much consumption in, in the, in the um, uh, consumption via uh, pollution of the water. Uh, the public water supply that we think of when we turn on our taps or our spigots uh, of water don't really change the uh, uh, are not really a very large amount of the annual water withdrawal. Quite a bit of this is in fact discharged directly, although then again it's kind of polluted. Same with mining, agri aquaculture, and livestock. Uh, ir irrigational use is a very large amount and thermoelectric cooling is a very large 
user of water, both surface saline water and surface fresh water. Um, uh, ground saline groundwater is not used very much. There's a fair bit of it in the world, but um, it's not not used very much. It's a very hard sort of thing to deal with. So this gives you some idea about the relative amounts of use of water, um, at least for one area of the world. This is the United States. Each person uses a lot of water every day. Now, um, in the United States, people use, in one way or another, about 2,000 cubic meters. That's about, for those of you who don't do metric system, it's uh, about um, 2,000 cubic yards. A meter is very close to a yard in size. It's slightly, <clears throat> slightly bigger. Um, in the state where I often work, in Iowa, uh, we use just a little bit less than that, down around 1,400. We have a lot of water available and so don't use quite as much for sort of things like irrigation. Canada uses less. Egypt uses less. They just don't, don't simply have very much of it. Finland has a lot of water but don't use very much of it as there's really no need for irrigational use. I suspect a fair amount could be used for hydroelectric power generation. And Belgium uses even less. So um, in the people in Belgium per capita use, uh, a, well, way less than half of the water annually as the average citizen of the U.S. Uh, we tend to be rather wasteful of water. But we also have a diverse landscape that requires uh, irrigation on a substantial amount of it for food production. So people use a, a lot of water. We can talk about people who live in the state of Iowa. People in the state of Iowa use on average about 960 gallons of water each day. Now that makes a fairly big shower, but that isn't how we use it. Um, 164 gallons of that uh, use per day is not returned to the water source. This state that uh, I have been working in um, ranks 33rd in water use um, in the United States, but 46th in water availability. More than 75% of Iowa water comes from lakes and rivers, and that's pretty much the same for a lot of, um, for many uh, different areas uh, of the United States. Here's a little graph showing the relationship between the water area, ratio of water area to total area with water use in gallons per person per day, just to illustrate that where people have a lot of water available, they just don't use that much. <coughs> this graph um, is a little bit dated, but there just aren't any available that um, are, are more recent. But I think the same trends sort of apply. Basically, what you're seeing here is over time an increase in water use. and um, uh, also, if you look at the color of the bars, you'll notice that most of the water is used for thermoelectric power generation and uh, uh, somewhat less for irrigation. Irrigation and thermoelectric power generation are very different in what they do to the water uh, in that it's more greatly changed when used for irrigation. Public supply, the little purple bars, is really pretty small amount of it, um, a small amount of use. And then the rural, uh, rural domestic and livestock use is a, a little pink tab down at the bottom. These data are from the United States uh, Geological Service. Well, how do we use all this water, this 960 gallons that <clears throat> people in, in my state use? Well, they, it's used uh, for a lot of things, but here's some, here's some data. Uh, frozen fruits and vegetables cost us about 11 gallons per pound to prepare. Brewing uh, beer um, takes about 48 gallons per gallon of beer. Paper takes a lot of water, 325 gallons per ream. Synthetic fiber uh, generation, uh, creation is about 230 gallons per pound. Um, and petroleum refining, every gallon of gasoline um, costs about 44 gallons, um, 44 gallons of water to create in the re refining. And you can see some other numbers down there. Aluminum cans that people use for beverages um, cost about two gallons each. Uh, per can to create. So um, an automobile is 37,000 gallons per car, so quite a bit of uh, water use. These graphs just so, show trends in extraction and consumption. Extraction is the amount, uh, is the amount that we take of a, of a resource. And just looking at it, we've got three panels, agriculture, domestic use, and industrial. The bars are much higher for agriculture. Agriculture uses a lot. Um, domestic use is less, and then industry use is less. But you can see that these amounts are growing. Also, the gray, uh, um, 
areas on these graphs show um, the um, the amount that's the the difference between the amount of water extracted and that actually consumed, and so um, the gray is the amount that actually could be recycled. Um, in many cases, uh, uh, we are using more water um, than we actually have as renewal, so we're using water often in a non-sustainable way. This is demonstrated by this graph. Um, th on the left, you see in the left-hand panel, you see see per capita. Uh, water use, and this is um, cubic meters of water per capita per year for a variety of different countries in the world. Over to the right, you see the percentage of total re uh, renewable resources that's represented by that um, consumption. And farther right, you see the uh, percentage, the amount of consumption as a percent of internal resources. I'm going to look at this in a slightly different way to make it easier to understand in this next graph. So here what I've done is created um, the relationship between, oh, actually just for a variety of different countries, shown the abstraction or extraction of water as a multiple of the renewal rate of, of water <coughs> to give you a sense of whether um, water is being overexploited. So this is the uh, where abstraction would be equal to renewal. So any bar to the right of this, the people in that country are using more water than they actually are getting back every year, and so we're using water in a non-sustainable fashion. Some countries, uh, we are using almost triple our water uh, renewal rate every year in terms of abstraction. Some countries, like the Netherlands, who has not very much water at all, are using many, many times uh, their um, annual renewal rate, and so clearly are not using um, using water in a sustainable sort of fashion for their country. This is giving rise to uh, water stress around the world, this high rate of use. And here we see the, um, the different colors represent the uh, ratio of water withdrawals or uh, extractions to the available flow. And the dark red uh, show uh, very extremely high water stress where um, water is being used at a, at a almost as great a rate as it's being renewed uh, in each of the countries. The gray area, these are des desert areas where there's no water particularly, um, so clearly there's already water stress there. The red areas around the world, I think, give you a sense of where there's conflict in the world, and um, especially over water, but um, uh, water use in many of these dryish reason regions uh, causes a great deal of stress and economic harm. So where do we get our water? And I met, mentioned this before. A large fraction of the water that we use comes from um, from ground from uh, surface water. The green bar, the um, sorry, the light blue bar is total withdrawals of water in the, in the United States, and um, the green bar is the surface water extraction, and the brown bar is the groundwater extraction. Clear to see that water extraction is rising over time, and that much of it is taken from surface waters, those surf same surface waters that we pollute by various u uses and cause it to no longer to be usable. So you might ask why surface uh, fresh waters are used disproportionately for industrial, agricultural, and domestic supplies. It's simply because it's cheap. Um, you can pump water much more rapidly out of surface waters than you can from deep groundwater. And, um, and it's also very inexpensive uh, to do it and you can do it very rapidly. Surface waters, fresh waters, are renewed fairly quickly, although the average renewal rate, as I told you before, is only about 7% per year. So there's a fair, fair issue um, with that fast rate of renewal. Generally, we shouldn't take more than 7% of the water every year that we have available on the planet, or we will, in fact, be overexploiting it. Uh, also, surface fresh waters are our traditional water resources, probably due to the first two bullet points. It's cheap and it's easy. Physical water use trends are increasing too, and these are old numbers, and I apologize. They're really hard to come by. But generally, all I wanted to say by this is hydroelectric power use seems to be increasing not only in the United States but around the world. And freight transport on water, because of our needs to save fuel, um, uh, is also uh, also increasing over time. 
We're also impounding a lot of water. Uh, this is a graph showing the cumulative impounded area in the United States. Impounded means made into a reservoir with a dam or something, water behind dams, essentially. And because it's a logarithmic scale on the left-hand side, um, you can, and it's almost a linear increase, you can see that um, uh, cumulative impounded area is increasing geometrically with time, up until recently where you see a little plateau at the top. Um, and this is, um, this is simply because we're running out of land uh, to put um, impoundments or reservoirs on. Uh, also, uh, the graph on the right shows uh, the terrific uh, rate of construction of farm ponds. Farm ponds are a very fast-growing source of water for irrigation and stock watering um, worldwide, and they can be as much as 8% of the entire farm area. Um, and also, the more precipitation there is in an area, the more of these ponds they'll have. Although in places like Kurnool province of India, um, they're doubling uh, the number, almost doubling the number of, um, of uh, impoundments called tanks um, of every year. So it's rising very fast. Boating recreation is sort of is passive, but it's a very, very um, a lucrative industry and a very important one. And so it's important to have good waters for boating um, uh, uh, anywhere in the world, really. These are some data that are really hard to get from National Marine Manufacturing Association. This shows the economic significance of recreational boating just in the United States, but there are 12 million recreational boats and um, the use of these generates somewhere in the neighborhood of $120 billion annually. Um, most of them are power boats, some sailboats, personal watercraft, and various other boats, and I have to tell you I probably own most of those except for the PWCs. Lots of boats, lots of economic activity, about a million jobs annually generated by recreational boating use, and probably about 80% of that uh, recreational boating use, uh, that may be an overestimate, maybe let's say 60 or 70% of the recreational boating use is inland. Uh, people in different states spend a, in the United States spend a different um, different amount of money on boats. Um, Alaska is number one. These are a bit old data. Minnesota next. They both have lots of water. Louisiana, again, um, little some places even like North Dakota have a lot of boats, um, even though they have very little water. Uh, it's a very lucrative industry. Passive use in commercial fishing is increasing. The numbers are hard to see here. Sorry about that, but. It, uh, Commercial fish catch, as I said before, is increasing. So if you add all these sorts of passive uses of water resources together, they make a fairly large amount of money. Um, and I'll show it to you on the next two slides. Um, freshwater fishing worth about $23 billion a year in the U.S. Um, maybe boating other than fishing boats is another $10 billion annually. Uh, hunting waterfowl about a billion dollars every year non-consumptive uh, wildlife use, it's often associated with water, is about $18 billion annually in revenues. And then there are the premiums for wa all waterfront property. If it's on good water, uh, the property is worth a lot compared to if it's on poor water or no water at all. And this is called amenity or hedonic value. Um, when you do economic analyses of, of what kinds of uh, what kinds of waters make um, make uh, water or land be worth a lot. Um, sizes of water body, unspoiled beauty, depth, and, and sort of a meandered shore are all positively related to the value of land around it. Things like low water clarity, oxygen depletion, and odor have a very big negative effect on um, the economic numbers. So if you add all these together and look at freshwater recreational use of water, it's a $52 billion per year industry and does not even include real estate premiums due to hedonic or amenity values of water. This compares, this is a very big number compared to things like the motor vehicle industry, ag income, motion picture in industry, and so on. Um, it is, a re freshwater recreational use is of course a diffuse sort of industry, so it doesn't have big companies negotiating for tax breaks and things like that. But um, if it were aggregated together, it would be a fairly large lobby compared to most industries. We've done some studies on trying to determine how much better water quality is worth. 
Um, and we've done some things called willingness to pay analyses. And we did this on Clear Lake, and we found that one lake in, in Iowa, an area with not very great water quality, the people were willing to pay 40 to $80 million uh, total for improved water, water quality. And when we estimated the restoration costs uh, to make it improved, it was only $16 million. So it's a, a pretty easy... Um, uh, it's pretty easy to conclude that that would be a good kind of thing to do for the people. It's worth a lot to them. We've also done some uh, some surveys uh, using uh, techniques called revealed preference analysis, sort of regional analyses, and these are done uh, using surveys, a large number of surveys, and we look for preferences for lake recreation determined by travel costs, that is, how far will people go to get to a good l lake versus a bad one. Uh, how frequently they go, how long they stay, and something called opportunity cost, which is the income that they have foregone in order to earn that income. Um, we related th all these uh, measurements to ecological characteristics with some fancy uh, techniques um, and um, uh, fancy statistical techniques that we don't need to review. You can trust us for those details, but here's what we found was uh, that secchi disk transparency of water made it worth a lot more money and some of the bad uh, chemicals that you find in water, like ammonia, phosphorus, and suspended solids, like suspended soil particles and so on, and high pH that's associated with algae blooms, had very negative effects on the value, uh, the value of uh, recreational experiences in those water bodies. Impaired water bodies, uh, water quality is uh, degenerating sort of all over the place as we a struggle to uh, have bigger industries to serve more people and more agriculture to feed um, the world's people. This uh, little graph is from uh, the state of Minnesota in the United States showing uh, the number of lakes over time in the red line that were considered by a federal agency to be n to not meet their intended use, that is to say couldn't be used for swimming, fishing, boating, water sources, and so on. So obviously rising, rising very rapidly, even in a place with relatively good water quality. If you want to uh, understand uh, what the most important problems of limnology are today and in, uh, uh, in 10 years from now, simply can look at this list. Our major problems today are number one, eutrophication and other water pollution. Number two, aquatic invasive species such as zebra mussels and so on that are um, degrading water bodies, the effects of altered hydro hydrology, changing flow structure that changes the next one, which is habitat destruction, basically it changes habitat. Climate change is a huge uh, impact, um, has a huge impact on water quantity and quality. And there are other things, um, number six here is novel chemicals, including xenobiotics. And these are toxins and drugs, things like chemotherapy agents and uh, birth control pills and caffeine and pesticides and herbicides and so on that we find in water, 20,000 new substances annually. Lost biodiversity and endangered species, another huge problem being faced in water, over-exploitation and overuse, uh, especially in fishing, and agricultural impact. In the future, um, limnologists, this is from a, a series of surveys I have done on limnological experts, um, people are still expecting eutrophication to be a problem because we're just not making progress on it. Expecting aquatic invasive species to be problematic, although most scientists are, are um, expecting global biotic homogenization. People are still expecting agricultural impact even to be a worse problem as we struggle to feed the growing population of the earth. Climate change is still in there, novel chemicals, xenobiotics, uh, effects of altered hydrologies just simply change place. And then sustainable freshwater supply within 10 years, I think most limnologists are, um, are expecting us to have problems of water supply that are even greater than we have today. And mine pollution for extraction of various mineral resources also considered to be a growing problem. And then um, thinking a bit more broadly, um, we, this we already see today, but it's not as huge a problem as it will be soon and that is the effect of inland water pollution on marine eutrophication. So lots of problems to be solved by this a very vibrant science. Next, the last, one of the last things I want to talk to you about is who studies water resources. 
And there are lots of people who do this uh, in one part or another. <clears throat> and they are um, hydrologists, civil engineers, hydrogeologists. Those are people who study groundwater, meteorologists who study weather, water chemists um, uh, who study the chemistry in water, water physicists study physics, not surprisingly, aquatic biologists study biology. Um, and resource economists look at things like supply, quality, and value of water resources, whereas limnologists and oceanographers study all of those areas for continental waters and for exocontinental or, let's say, uh, marine, marine waters. So limnology is multidisciplinary, uh, pluridisciplinary, and uh, if you can't decide what field to go into, decide to be a limnologist because you can do any of the above basically and still be, uh, or you could be an oceanographer and do all those things too. So hydro hydrologists, uh, geologists study these things, civil engineers, meteorologists, oceanographers, limnologists, and the increasing job of limnologists is simply to help assure a healthy water supply for the people and ecosystems of the earth. And you need to understand how those systems work before you can do that. And that's what will be contained in subsequent uh, modules. So the conclusions are from this uh, module, where are, where are the waters of the Earth? They're in the oceans, atmosphere, surface waters. There are three categories of use. They're consumption, physical, and passive. The value of water is extremely high. And these waters are studied by a large number of people. But limnologists and aquatic ecologists tend to be of disproportionate importance because they bridge across all those fields and are charged basically with the biological, chemical, physical um, uh, maintenance of high quality in this most important uh, resource, um, this most important strategic resource um, that we um, work on every day.